let me first introduce you shortly to Maria, Maria Maino, because uh, besides being one of the co-founders of the research platform SIM, Maria is actively involved in Sistema Italia, as well as vice president of Sistema Europe. And as such, she's in regular contact with many practitioners of the Sistema-inspired projects in different countries in the northern as well as uh, the southern hemisphere. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lucas. It's such a wonderful opportunity actually to look into a field that is not directly the one uh, that I have been involved in. Um, in fact, uh, research about the social impact of making music is also um, something that I am uh, very keen on because of uh, being involved for 30 years in a foundation for child neurology. So the individual and collective practice of music and its effects are very close to my head and to my heart. And um, I'm also very excited the day after uh, International Women's Day to be in an all women panel. I don't think we have to be segregated anymore, but I think it's wonderful to see how many women are active in this field. And um, also looking around at other countries, um, I think this is a really uh, new opportunity for uh, equality and actually for academic research uh, being proposed across the spectrum, um, a geographical one also, because having studied a little bit more now what the, the global South mean, it doesn't necessarily mean South, it doesn't necessarily mean global, there are exceptions. So it, it's also a way of of approaching this critically and however um, with greatly open eyes and ears so um, without taking time now because we will have a, a, a most opportunities for a discussion afterward um, I would like to introduce uh, Viviana Valenzuela now we chose to start with her presentation because it is perhaps more inspired by historic precedents and also brings them into the present Viviana is a professor in in Buenos Aires. She is actually connected from there and uh, is a specialist in educational psychology with orientation in vocational and professional guidance. So a psychologist who is very close to the field. And um, we will hear her, her presentation now. Um, and she will also, I think, uh, give us some input about complementary material that we can uh, then get to know on our own. Thank you very much, uh, Viviana. And uh, we we very much look forward. Thanks. You're, mute. You're still muted. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm a psychologist uh, from the University of Buenos Aires. Uh, please let me share my window with you. Here, this is the scheme of my presentation. Um, as you said, I'm a specialist in lifelong guidance and counseling, currently focusing in uh, music related social and community projects. My PhD thesis is framed under the issues of educational and vocational guidance. The research topic is youth and children's orchestras and is based on the theoretical framework of lifelong guidance and counseling which highlights life project and identity construction, the development of valued life narratives, successfully coping with transitions, and the achievement of well-being. I would like to share with you various aspects of my thesis, which was presented in 2020 and is currently uh, under evaluation. The objectives of the research are to explore the meanings of the orchestra experience for the young participants, analyze the relations between their educational experience in the, in the orchestra and at school, investigate which kind of project they have and their relation with the orchestra experience, and lastly, to describe and analyze the identity construction process that the orchestra fosters. Some of the questions that emerged from the objectives and guided the inquiry were, how does this experience connect with the educational pathway? which are the meanings that the participants give to the orchestra, orchestra experience, which resources and personal skills do they build? 
Does the proposal promote the elaboration of future perspectives and which are the future prospects that are expressed in the participants' narratives? And finally, does the orchestra experience promote value narratives relative to the method? It had an, an ethnographic approach and was carried out during the years 2016 and 2017 in two orchestras of the province of Buenos Aires, Argentina. The data collection techniques were participant observation during all the activities held by the orchestra and narrative interviews to 10 young men and nine young women between the ages of 13 and 19. I also interviewed teachers, orchestra directors and parents. I made an inductive uh, thematic content analysis and processed information in Atlas D software. Um, about the orchestras, uh, both orchestras are publicly funded orchestras from the province of Buenos Aires and are located on the outskirts of the city of Buenos Aires, that is the capital of Argentina. In this video, you can see the amount of, of orchestras, both in Argentina and in the province of Buenos Aires. This is Buenos Aires, the city of Buenos Aires, and the two orchestras are located between the city of Buenos Aires and the city of La Plata, that's the capital of the province of Buenos Aires. The first one is La Orquesta Infanto Juvenil de uh, Utson, which is part of the orchestra system of the province of Buenos Aires. It holds its activities at a rural school where the majority of the students come from families that work in nearby farms. The rest of the students walk 15 blocks on dirt roads to get to school and there is no bus system available. The other orchestra is called La Sonora de la Yapi and it's part of the Chasarreta program, which was mentioned by Jeff Baker in his keynote presentation. It holds its activities at the Santa Maria Yapi neighborhood, which is also called Villa de la Yapi because it started as a shanty town and even today some areas are still very vulnerable. Both orchestras had different instrument organization. One had symphonic format, while the other had an Argentine Latin American instrument format. Uh, however, the repertoires uh, were uh, similar, similar, were similar. About the results. The, um, the research allowed to the for the construction of the concept of orchestra experience, uh, that is a particular socio-educational uh, experience that consists of three distinct characteristics. Firstly, it allows a student to build general and specific knowledge for life and work. Also, results from my research show that many students improve their school pathway uh, thanks to the learning experience provided by the orchestra. For some students, traditional teaching modalities do not lead to satisfactory learning processes and turn out to be obstacles in the construction of meaningful school pathways. In the orchestra, teaching begins at each student's starting point and advances in accordance to personal progress, shattering the notion of failure. Secondly, it fosters a sense of agency in the participants, allowing them to become active agents in their communities, to feel recognized and capable of transforming themselves and others. The collective teaching proposal allows for the joining with others to achieve learning as a group, while recovering values such as cooperation in the construction of knowledge. Culture is constructed based on both hegemonic and non-hegemonic models, including different repertoires from classical music to cumbia rhythm, Argentine folklore, or the national anthem, which also promotes the opening of an array of possibilities. And lastly, as a, transi a transition facilitator device, it enables the possibility to rehearse roles, explore interests, and experience motivation while promoting self-knowledge autonomy and self-determination. All these processes are necessary for the elaboration of future perspectives and value life narratives in connection with total well-being, which is multidimensional and may also relate to overall health processes. Some of the challenges we face are, despite 
the participants belonging to very vulnerable social groups, we know they may be not the most vulnerable, but that does not mean that they cannot significantly improve their quality of life. There may be some aspect, interesting aspect to discuss with the work of Gabriela Wald of Argentina that was cited by Jeff in his keynote presentation. There is still much work to be done on how to reach out, reach out uh, to those that are the most vulnerable and also how to get more families more deeply involved. Despite the learning processes taking place, these are not easily recognized and capitalized by the social actors in the terms they are proposed. Specific guidance and counseling devices and a specific training of teachers on the subject would allow these young participants to recognize the specific and general skills and knowledge acquired during the orchestra experience. There is still much research to be conducted, both from the field of psychology and from guidance and counseling on the concrete experiences lived by the participants in this type of programs. And I believe action research is the best approach. Some contributions to SIM from the field of psychology, particularly from guidance and counseling, the results help to understand the way in which these non-formal socio-educational projects cooperate in the processes of identity construct construction, such as self-knowledge and self-confidence. It it's, uh, also shows how these devices may be generated with the names toward prevention and the construction of valued narratives, thus uh, achieving valued lives derived from educational devices. By providing a theoretical background, it may also contribute to the design of public policies for educational devices, not only orchestras, but all type of non-formal educational projects. The final goal of this line of research is the promotion uh, of the of equity and social justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Viviana. So um, I think it was a very clear and uh, well structured presentation of what the work is being done there in different ways in different territories and also gave us some important keywords uh, that we will come back to. Um, I think the a key one bridging the individual and the collective is, of course, development, because as you mentioned at the end, um, it is also a way of uh, of creating um, consensus and informed consensus about um, how to intervene uh, through music towards equity, social justice, and possibly also sustainable development, which is, again, another uh, way that individual, cognitives, collective, social, um, all these spheres uh, can, can be brought together to create positive change. Um, and also the, the key word of well-being, I think, uh, should be gotten back to. And I'm sure that the next two presentations will also refer to that. Um, and now we will um, change uh, continent. Thank you also about evoking the, the, key, the keynote lecture because um, Colombia is a star country in the presentation of, of the Global South. And we are very grateful that we can have now a panel of more countries. Uh, and uh, moving now to the the challenges that um, Agatha Rica is encountering um, along with her successes in uh, in choral, more, mostly co and therefore vocally oriented. We had more or orchestrally oriented uh, projects in the first presentation. So we, now we have the voice at the center and we hear Agatha's voice telling her uh, her experiences and, and what she's encountering, especially now uh, when it's not as easy as before to sing together. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. I will share my screen. Okay, so hello and thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm a classically trained choir conductor that has been working for 12 years with different communities and amateur choirs. Uh, also with the experience in formal music uh, education. I'm doing my doctoral studies in the University of, of Aveiro under the guidance of Dr. Paulo Maria Rodrigues. Uh, Robert Musil, in his book, Men Without Qualities, defined what he calls sense of possibility as the ability to conceive of everything that might be. The faculty of imagination as a tool to provide freedom to transform has already been conceived by Sartre. For Sartre, a consciousness that could not imagine would remain drowned in the real, unable to project possibility, difference, and above all, change. 
With these ideas as a background, I will define sense of possibility in this presentation as imagination, as a wish and will, but also as a not yet born reality in Musil's words. So my question is, how can choir practice be a way to find or create a sense of possibility? Previous researches show that singing can improve self-esteem, well-being, and help in the creation of new and meaning meaningful bonds. And that in situation of marginalization, singing with other people can help in integration and sense of belonging. A choir can be a safe place, a place to share, to build imaginations of possible selves, to give a voice. Singing in a choir can be a channel for expression and communication and for shared enjoyable moments. Let me now tell you about three different projects that have in common the choral practice. In two of them, I was an observer with a very brief participation, just leading few rehearsals. And in the third one, I'm a regular teacher and it's an ongoing partnership. In January 2020, I traveled to Lebanon to get to know two different projects implemented by the Arab a cappella choir, Feha Choir. Lebanon is a small country and very multicultural. And this is Tripoli, Lebanon's second biggest city and also one of the poorest. And the border between these two neighborhoods, Bab al Tabene and Jabal Musin, is a place of conflict since the 70s based on religious and political matters. In the interest of the, both neighborhoods are soldiers and war tanks and all the buildings as you can see in this picture are craved with bullet holes. So this is the poorest part of the city. And this is Nagam Choir. They rehearse twice a week in the middle of the two neighborhoods. They sing Arabic music with polyphonic arrangements. It started in March 2019 and it targets youth from both neighborhoods to unite them for a common goal, which is building bridges and promoting to the other communities the difference and rich identities of both areas. In the end of a rehearsal that I had the opportunity to facilitate, we all sat in a circle and talked about the meaning of the choir. The choir members said they don't feel different from each other. They feel like a family and they, they don't understand this war. They talked about the importance of the commitment, the relationship of respect and trust with the conductor and the possibility to express their feelings through their singing. The choir now also wants to do some work with the families. Another project is, really, is located in Beka Valley. It's very close to Syria. So it's a place with a lot of refugee camps. This is Children of Syria Choir. This choir works with Syrian children refugees to help them overcome the trauma, trauma after the war. They rehearse once a week and sing Arabic songs in unison. These children live in several camps in the region. We worked briefly together. In the beginning, they were very shy, but not so much in the end. They were dancing, clapping, standing. Even if we didn't speak a common language, the communication was not a problem and the manifestation of care and curiosity, uh, even with a, such a short meeting, uh, was very moving. And the last project that I want to present to you is Chiquiti in Maputo, the capital of Mozambique in Africa. Mozambique was a Portuguese colony until 1975. After that, the country and the population struggled with the civil war until 92. According to the International Monetary Fund and the World Economic Outlook, uh, Mozambique is the seventh poor country in the world. Shikiti is a project of collective music teaching that aims social integration and professional capacitation for future musicians. It was founded in 2013 and it belongs to Kulunguana, a cultural association. The project has a big focus in classical and traditional music. Nowadays, has approximately 200 students between 5 and 25 years old, with both collective and individual lessons. It has three choirs, children, youth, and chamber choir. In to total, I have around 100 students in these choirs. The choirs sing all kinds of musical genres, and the project is open to all and provides free education, transport, and food, together with a lot of different opportunities of performance, uh, travels, exchanges, and festivals. Sometimes this situation can happen. In this photo, you can see at rehearsal that we were having in a day without electricity. And usually these are great rehearsals because everyone wants to make it happen and to make it work. These students have such a will to learn, to sing and to make music together. When I first worked with the project in 2019, we performed an opera, often bars or fields on the world. This opera was something new in Mozambique and it was an amazing experience for everybody involved. 
it was translated into Portuguese and all the references of food or places were changed to the Mozambican reality. We even used some local slang. During the quarantine, uh, the project physically closed and the students have been working from their homes. The majority of the students don't have Wi-Fi or computers. Some of them don't even have mobile phones or mobile phones with camera and sound recorder. Our tool was WhatsApp and the project tried to provide ways to help the students. Being able to work with the students apart was also being able to be a part of their lives, to understand if they were dealing well with the pandemic situation and keeping them motivated during a difficult period. Let me show you a small result of the work. This video um, starts with the work we did at home and ends with the result of that in a concert that we had the opportunity to have last December after nine months working apart. Despite the differences of these three projects in the repertoire, context, goals, settings that also imply different strategies and approaches, I found similarities. The happiness and joy during rehearsals and performances, the love for singing, for the choir, for the friends. And some of the singers show that they have now a different way of imagining and looking to the future, maybe one with more possibilities or different ones. Some students from Chiquiti are now studying music abroad in the university. Others are going to be music teachers in Mozambique. Another, another student, for example, is involved in artistic projects related with the maintenance of Mozambican traditional music and roots. Some choir members from Nagam Choir are now also singing in another choir, almost professional, with great national and international visibilities and world tours. And some children from the Refugee Children Choir were happy while they were rehearsing and playing in a safe place, contrasting with their very difficult lives at the camp and back home. These experiences are part of my PhD. If COVID allows, the goal is to create a project based in choral practice in a refugee camp in Greece next year. All the experience I'm living are extremely rewarding and make me review my practice and looking to the future in a very different way. I would like to share with you some questions that I have been thinking during this research. Um, the repertoire, the traditional versus the classical. How can I mix community music strategies with a more formal choir rehearsal approach? Ethical and research issues. Sometimes I feel difficulties to do research when I'm too close to the situation. Another question is related to me being a foreigner in this context. And finally, I'm observing and participating in projects where the participants are already very motivated. What happens if I have to start a project? Am I going to be able to motivate them uh, from the beginning? The foundation that allows these doubts to flourish is what I believe from this experience and from my students' work, and you can read them in the background of this slide, um, can be the role of these choirs, grounded in care, respect, trust, love, humanity, hospitality, and based in relationships to help rediscover change or create a sense of possibility. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Agatha. I think uh, also you have uh, very convincingly shown us um, that there is a way to ask oneself why one does things and apply it in the how. And every day I think um, we who deal with music um, have to ask ourselves these questions. Why is music so important? And we see it uh, also in the faces of the children and also the intergenerational spirit that animates your project. It's clear that the last thing we should do in the case of the pandemic is to drop that. On the contrary, we have to work on that. And they are completely aware that this is essential.
And, and so we really cannot drop the ball. And fortunately, everybody has a voice. So this is what we are building on, pandemic or no pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, and, uh, and then now to um, an, another big jump of continent um, with the presentation of Natalia Puerta which is part of the uh, multi-center research, comparative research uh, based on in the Guildhall School uh, and masterminded by the Guildhall School with, together with the SIM platform, um, which also has been uh, as a fil rouge present uh, through this whole symposium. Um, a Colombian case study is therefore um, from uh, Natalia Puerta. And please, let's pay attention again on the many levels on which um, she touches on development, which will be one of our recurring themes. Thank you, Maria. Can you listen to me? Okay. So today I would like to share my ongoing doctoral research called Implications of Music Education in Social and Human Development, a Colombia case study. In the following minutes, in the following minutes, I would talk briefly uh, about the background of this research, the research itself, and some of the discussions I identified during my fieldwork here in Colombia. In 2010, I was working as a coordinator of the music training component of the National Plan of Music for Living Together. This plan was created by the Ministry of Culture of Colombia in 2003 as a state policy with the purpose of ensuring Colombians' cultural and educative rights to know, practice, and enjoy musical creation from the existing cultural processes and the vast musical richness of this country. To do this, the plan centered a big part of its action on the creation of more than 1,135 music schools in other municipalities of Colombia. But I'm not referring here to the plan because it is the central object of my study. Rather, my experiences and knowledge of this policy, um, its conceptual developments, achievements, challenges, have constituted the fertile breeding ground from which this research emerged. Specifically, my main interest has been to understand how, in which ways, and to what extent, music pedagogies, management designs, and sets of relational practices of this non-formal music educational process have been promoting social and human development at local level. To investigate this, I decided to concentrate my study in one case, the Music School of Ginebra Valle Canto por la Vida. This school attracted my attention since it has been recognized as one of the most stable and significant experiences within the music school's context in Colombia. After more than 25 years, Canto por la Vida consolidated a music and a pedagogical project that has strengthened the Colombian Andean music, what it has been called. Although Canto por la Vida is not a public music school, it is strongly linked to the national plan. It has been its local partner on the implementation of its musical policies, and it has been benefited and influenced by its actions, purposes, and principles. Seeking to value the social experience of the Global South, as Maria stated, my first challenge was to identify the notions of development that were operating in this, con in this particular context. Could those notions illuminate alternative ways of understanding the value of music making on development in more expansive ways that they imagine by the mainstream development frameworks? The early stages of the field work. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Can you uh, full screen? I, I have the, I am in full screen. Is it fine? Uh, no, it, you may be, you may be full screen for you, but the presentation mode is small. Oh. So maybe you want to look at how to visualize. Sorry. Is it fine? It's no? the same. Uh, let me 
tried something else quickly. It's worth it, you know, even if we waste 30 seconds, you know, yes. everybody will be able to better remember uh -huh. what you said. Okay. And since it's very concentrated. Now, this is better. Now, mm, I would say leave it up. No, 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 no. <laughs> Go back. <laughs> the one okay. that you now, let's have it like this if you can. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's better. Yeah. So, um, so the early stages of my field work allowed me to identify three distinct categories of development <clears throat> that now form working hypotheses to be studied. The first one is to conceive music development as social and human development. The second is to conceive the structuring of the organizational field of music as a factor of social welfare. And the third one is to conceive music development as right and the expansion on human, of human developments. Today, I would like to briefly focus on the first category to discuss aspects that can possibly contribute to some of the discussions that tackled during this seminar. After one year and a half of ethnographic work in Ginebra, became evident the great effort of the school to promote music development and this at the center of its action. Although Canto por la Vida state <clears throat> that through its training processes, it also raises educational and cultural conditions, helping to enrich the sense of belonging, the school doesn't vindicate music making as a solution to structural social problems. So I started to wonder, is it, is it possible to music to this music school to impact socially if it is not centered on pursuing specific social outcomes? The conceptual developments of the National Plan of Music helped me to understand some factor at stake. Although the plan was depicted as a music policy for the sake of, sake of coexistence, since its creation, it consciously positioned itself as a music policy to dimension music from its intrinsic nature, and not only as an object to be instrumentalized based on certain social objectives. So from the beginning, the plan radically took distance from programs such as Batuta in Colombia. As the ex-director of this plan stated, in all of our experience, a very strong challenge was precisely to overcome the dichotomy between the artistic and the social. And it seems to me that to a large extent, overcoming, overcoming the tendency to dichotomize these two great dimensions was precisely mediated by the educational aspects, its purposes and processes. If we are working in a methodological approach that promotes and manages to build real basis of artistic creation and expression, we are precisely making feasible the process of social renewal. In other words, promoting autonomous, perceptual and sensitive training in, is the most expeditious way of approaching an ideal of social project that contributes to freedom, autonomy, creative independence, independence and self-judgment. Judgment, sorry. This made me wonder how this relationship between the social and the artistic operated in Ginebra's music school if its music pedagogies and methodological approaches were favoring such integration, or if by the contrary, the conditions to build the basis of artistic creation and expression were not promoted in such musical and pedagogical traditions. Regarding the above, I found an increased tension between two different trends within the same educative musical project. On the one hand, the search for deepening on the Colombian Andean music as the main objective of the school, and on the other, the search for promoting musical diversity, creativity, interdisciplinarity, and critical think thinking as means to meet the educative, cultural, and social purposes of the program. In effect, the Colombian Andean music seemed to be valued by some members of the community as conservative, rigid, dogmatic, an ankylos practice that reinforced social and educative problems through its music pedagogies and philosophies. Even some members say that its pedagogies doesn't allow the students to create, experiment, and explore, to fully discover their own musical identities and voices, and that in fact that these musical practices don't, doesn't fully represent uh, the locust people's identities and traditions. On the other side of the coin, 
Canto por la Vida's Music Schools is seen by others as contracultural and as emancipatory, as a music project of resistance that promotes music that is not listening to on the main street media and that is not still recognized by music conservatoires. A pedagogical project that from a Latin Americanist project or vision values territory and its musical resources. Some of them highlight the importance of Canto por la Vida's works on the possibility of inserting children and youth into a musical tradition to get into know deeply in a musical language, which requires masteries of its particular codes, aesthetics, and entails particular form of social, socialization, value, and, uh, jelly, jelly, and value of music. So during my field work, I could identify those, uh, how these strains of tensions have coexisted for more than 25 years of, within the project, actively dialoguing with the sustainability needs of the school through time and the fragility and complexity of the human relationship in place. So currently, I, I am investigating the nature of the logics behind of these Colombian Andean musical practices since I found it funda as a fundamental task to understand possible notions, levels, and atmospheres of social impact within this educative and musical context. The Colombian Andean music, its contradictions, ambivalences, and complexities offer significant, significant comprehensions on the hybrid processes from which an European musical heritage was filtered by Piazan practices in Colombia, configuring a musical expression that is still important to be studied as a way of understand who we are as Colombians. Finally, I wonder if making the arguments that, um, that making the arguments and approaches more complex, we can find mobility, nuances, transformations, and new ways of interpreting the experiences of the social impact of music making of over this, um, dichotomies and, du and dualities. And if this could favor clues about the factors at the stakes on the process of building common projects based on difference, alterity, in contexts um, as ours, very polarized and, and changing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Natalia, for showing us that actually duality flows directly into diversity and complementary elements of collective music making. Uh, it does not have to be polarized. On the contrary, it can help understand how an identity is stratified of many elements and how important it is to discover the various components of those elements, both in a, in a formal education and in non-formal education outside the school. Um, so I think th this was very revelatory and also um, indicative of how wide the scope of the research is, even though it it is a case study because it, it, it's concentrated, but it's in great depth. Thank you very much. So um, I think we have now a discussion between us, first of all. Um, I don't know if our host wishes to um, interject any um, comment already now, but um, my first question uh, in terms of our own experiences now. So we, we saw how we go about it. And, and I think within the discourse that we develop now is, is part of with whom and where we do it. And I wanted to hear a little bit more, if possible, from Natalia and Viviana, how the adaptation had to be made, uh, if you have been able to absorb the, uh, the, these, this integration of the new way of focusing on the individuality of the children and uh, the, the younger generation in particular uh, during the time of the pandemic. Uh, because Agatha told us um, quite, quite clearly what, and, and we saw how it worked. So I, I, I think it's, it's an important way of sharing progress, notwithstanding um, the involution of the pandemic. Um, in my case, um, in Ginebra, the pandemic uh, poses uh, interesting questions uh, to the project regarding the, the social outcomes of the, of the educative program. Uh, because 
when music, uh, uh, the music, these musical programs has to reach these uh, children and youth in, in their houses, uh, then the schools, the school is more aware about the social context, the family context and the issues that uh, these uh, students are going through. And then the social discussion came into uh, first place. To the foreground. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. to the foreground. So um, it, it was revealing for the program. Almost an opportunity it, in a way. Mm -hmm. An opportunity to uh, think about uh, the social impact uh, um, on, in, in this way. Um, and also to uh, start to systematize their own music uh, pedagogic program. Because uh, then it's not about translating the presencial the presenciality of the, the, the of that to change or to um, yeah, have an epistemolo epistemological changes about the, the methodologies uh, through vir virtual means. Mm -hmm. So it was an important, um, important to, to uh, integrate those reflections into the research as well. I would imagine, um, for, probably yes. for Viviana as well, working on the on both the local and the institutional plane of the research. Yes, uh, my research was uh, made. I I did a research, the inquiry, the, the ethnographical approach in 2016 and 2017. So. And we were <laughs> far from the from the pandemic, and we had the. But I follow the 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 outcomes the the they have in today uh, on the net, uh, Instagram, and, and Facebook, and also I have a lot of teachers that uh, colleagues and friends, and they have. They, it was uh, really challenging because uh, they they have to. To uh, in in my country, you you don't have internet uh, everywhere. The families don't have internet everywhere. Uh, so, or perhaps they have one computer for all the the kids. So um, they had to uh, make a lot of um, uh, different. Uh, the, uh, yeah, they do not have obviously the same type of access. The same practice, but yes, perhaps they did. They did, for instance, um, um, podcast or um, radio uh, radio programs where they, they invited the, the children to to play to give the experience. They made a lot of videos as as Agatha showed uh, a lot of um, videos from every um, different parts. They put it together. But they had a challenging um, a discussion of how to reach out to those that are the most vulnerable also, because uh, the, the, the technology is not uh, a good uh, here, a good uh, way of um, connecting people. I understand. I understand. And I wanted to ask um, Agatha, um, have you uh, thought of how to make this uh, experience into a replicable model? And have you already gotten to this stage? Because uh, one of the concerns of SIM is, of course, a great investment in each research, in each project, uh, but then how to share the experience so that the other one does not have to start from scratch and already always building on this pyramid uh, mm -hmm. with a wide base all over the world. And, and, and as we are talking now in the global south, uh, especially where resources, um, as, as was underlined um, by, by several projects during, during these years, especially if it's not a primary need to do the research and we are having to struggle to obtain the resources, um, how to um, really make uh, this groundwork um, into a, a model uh, that can be um, taken up and then developed again, our key word of development into the next stage. Um, so, Agatha, since you are um, far away, but I'm, it looks like there is a great need. Um, are you in contact with other colleagues in the Global South about how to multiply this? 
Uh, well, uh, no, not really, and that's a very good question because, uh, and I, I don't have an answer. <laughs> but in the, in the beginning, uh, when I started to think about my project before COVID and everything, I was thinking, okay, that's great. We, I'm going to create this project, and then maybe it, if it puts, works well, maybe it's possible to do it in other place, in other contexts. And now I'm not so sure and positive about that. I, I don't know if. I can do that because I also start to 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 look around to to see other projects, other colleagues working, and um, I I don't know because for me it's very difficult to to say okay let's let's replicate replicate this because we are always working with different people and different contexts so that's my uh, my difficulty regarding this question is how can we replicate something that well, yeah multiply more than yes the, the model can be replicated but the results have to be multiple or you know the engagement has to be multiplied yeah the, yeah the thing is i just i just said in my in my presentation that i found similar results so i think that that's uh, that's possible to uh, that's what i we want i think it's to, to find these positive results in different contexts but i i, I don't know how to how to multiply them or to to I, I don't know if I, I I still have a I already have a question uh, an answer for that question. Perhaps by sharing what worked and what didn't work. Sure. Maybe yeah. maybe yeah. giving each other a leg up about that. You know, we we I think we meet now for the first time, and then we will we will get the discussion with the, the participants. But um, perhaps already uh, having some kind of distillation of the experience of, of how we did it and what, what worked and didn't work. And it seems like a lot of things are still working in spite of the challenges. Um, and especially um, the hints towards a cooperation between a wider system and the local applications yeah. are solutions that we each have to find in our own context in order to ensure that the project is sustainable, yeah. both at its direct intervention level and its research level. Because we cannot, this is a great example from all of you being, or, or all of us actually, but yours especially, uh, in, in not giving up one thing in order to keep the other going. And uh, the, the, the field work and the field research and the theoretical research and the academic uh, distillation, as we called it before, is something that we have to pursue like, a, like all the different winds that we are following. Yeah. And maybe you had questions to ask um, each other now I that I asked to, you uh, questions. To add uh, what you were saying, um, I think we have to create more global um, uh, circulation indicator indicators uh, as social in, uh, what social impact is because I, i'm a psychologist that's my field of work and i think um, psychological indicators also show how um, social impact is, uh, is, is, is is made because we, we are talking about uh, being recognized, uh, feeling of social, uh, social acceptance, and self-confidence are uh, indicators that are linked with others and are linked to the community. And with the kid says, oh, my parents came and see me um, playing the guitar or the violin. Um, they, they are uh, constructing a relation with the community and uh, for me, it's social impact too. So uh, yeah. I think we have to, to create a broader, um, a global uh, indicators uh, that fit with, the, with our research. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, part of the problem is of having a multiplicity of indicators that are all, all quite time consuming. And then mm -hmm. the issue of having control groups, which is a bit of a waste sometimes. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we just have to give up on those and actually just do different kinds of interventions and see yes. how a music intervention or a sports intervention, we actually sometimes do mix those in terms of teamwork and uh, or artistic other type of you know more figurative intervention and and mix the cognitive results and mm -hmm. and the uh, behavioral results 
and uh, and the more social educational, interaction, yes. educational, of course, exactly the the, the school directly um, measurements of of the school results, which is mm -hmm. what is most frequently done. But yes. all of that takes a lot of time in terms of pre and post Hello. testing. And, uh, and to follow the, the children uh, longitudinally is, is a huge effort. You collect an enormous amount of data and then it would be good to have that circulate more. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And perhaps uh, as, as I was mentioning, would you like to ask each other some questions about the, the various intervention? We have a musician, we have a psychology, we have a psychologist and, and you, Natalia, being in the comparative research, what do you think that you're going to compare um, with, the, actually, with the other facets of, if you, if you want to tell us a little bit more about the contact within the network that's being coordinated by the Guild of School? Um, yeah, actually it was this link uh, with the discussion we, uh, you were having earlier. And it's about how actually, um, because, the, the context of this National Plan in Colombia um, offers insights. And, I mean, I'm not investigating specifically this National Music Plan as the object of my study, but understanding how um, these music schools can offer ways of understanding the social impact in different ways than the, um, that the normal, um, notions that we have um, uh, about its relationship with development. So the, the issue, for example, that the National Plans has had is that uh, lately in time, it was evaluated only just one indicator, which was um, having youth and children on training music, training um, uh, musical training programs. But these kind of indicators loses all the complexity and contribution of um, other factors in which music making <clears throat> is contributing a society in the in Latin American context, for example. So um, in the relationship with Guildhall and this <laughs> Academy of the Global North, if, if, if it is possible to say it, mm -hmm. Uh, I think the, what have to be discussing is how we expand these notions of um, development to expand also the value of music making in more complex ways that help us to build that kind of indicators and to understand better uh, our impact in societies. I very much agree because music is active even when we talk about the neurosciences on so many different parts of the brain uh, that process the different elements of music and they interact and it, it is a, a, a world when we don't really want to separate um, the, the more holistic involvement and it's very difficult to do research without analyzing elements but then we have to go back to a synthesis yes and, uh, but also being critical about the the, the that approach also because then we know by seeing research that music by itself doesn't necessarily promote positive uh, social impacts, right? So what is at the stake of this relationship and integration between the social and the artistic is what we have to be like deepening through research more and more. And Agatha was talking about motivation. And as you said, the key word artistic also the the children or the adults who are involved in the activities if there is no artistic quality they will stop being motivated mm -hmm. and so we, that's what we have experienced that also their own development their own growth their own interpretive and um how would i say almost physical technical but also emotional abilities in mastering uh, the content of of <laughs> growing difficulty of growing challenge uh, is it per, per se a motivation, but then it's in our hands to invest on that. Yeah, yeah. in the process. In to, the process. To, to achieve that, yeah. I, I would uh, like to just add that in that context, also the Latin American context can offer through these traditional music practices, also ways of understanding this 
kind uh, of complexity of relationship between these uh, two sides of the coin. So uh, I think um, not necessarily from an ethnomusicological background, but, but yes, to understand that musical diversity as a potency to understand also the different ways of um, doing uh, social impact through music making, it's uh, necessarily to, to, to have like more conscious about this uh, integration of this uh, musical diversity around yes. the world. Yes. Do you think probably now soon um, our coordinators will open the discussion to, to the um, attendees as well? Uh, but a very interesting theme for me is how from the experience of this research, we can help uh, pinpoint a more general base to, to um, have individual indicators and social indicators. Because all of us, when writing a grant proposal, for instance, we have to find indexes and indicators. <laughs> and in a way, we have to tailor these to each project. But if we had more discussion on putting this in a common uh, reservoir of ideas and of data, um, especially because a lot of it is individual, it is qualitative research, um, then I think the progress might be uh, faster. And, um, and I wonder if maybe on one of the next symposia, we could talk about pooling resources. Mm -hmm. because it, it has been really fascinating to see the differences between all um, the different approaches to the, the, to the various um, research projects in the different contexts. But now what, what do we have in common is also a question that it is raised um, all the time, I think, um, in the comparative research especially, and what is the difference and, and the common ground. Um, Natalia, how, how close are you to, to being able to say something about that? About what, what is in, what can we all have already learned from each other in the comparative research? Um, that's, that's a very good that, that's question. For the next, that's for yeah. the next discussion. For the next, <laughs> yes. Yes. Not yet. It's, <laughs> yes. it's, it's very important. I think, I think that we, um, um, the, first, the first thing to, is, is to understand that cultural and social context uh, can open up uh, ways of, as Agatha mentioned, social imaginational practices on how we we are um, impacting and how we and and how we can deploy um, um, a social project on our context. I mean, I mean the this uh, diversity is. Uh, from, from, from my side, the most important um, key to um, understand this field of social imagination on about what we can be done and, and what we could be as um, humans doing music and building societies in a more um, equal, uh, just uh, diverse in yeah, <laughs> ways. So I think, uh, yeah, um, cultural diversity is, uh, is, is key to this kind of social practices of my imagination in this field. Yes, I, I think, I, I'm sorry, yes. sorry, Vivian. Yeah. Then there, there are yes. a couple of interesting questions that I'm sure Lucas will want to relay just about that, actually. Uh, Viviana, please. No, no, uh, I, I agree. We have to avoid the, the, the dilemmas, the, the the, the dichotomy, the dichotomy yes. because it's very complex. Uh, I, I, I've seen uh, how, uh, for instance, classical music in a, in a community that, that only hears uh, cumbia rhythms or folklore, or it's, it, it opens the, an array of possibilities and the, the, the possi the, to know, to, 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 to know another cultures make, uh, makes yourself uh, have a diverse uh, possibility to choose. Uh, we, we, we cannot choose we, uh, the things we don't know. 
So I think that diversity, for instance, in repertoires, in instruments, in the orchestra, you, you select the instruments, you, you, you taste different instruments and you, uh, you can choose. And it's, it's the key uh, of uh, auto uh, self-determination and self-confidence. Yes. Yes, I, I think maybe we'll, we will now read a couple of the questions up there. I think jo Lucas is going to join us. Um, yeah. There, uh, thank you, Lucas. Maria, yes. <laughs> so yes, we, we, we don't have many questions today, but uh, I think- yeah, but We will have more as we keep one. going. Yes, uh, absolutely. So uh, it's maybe interesting to start with, uh, with John Sloboda's question uh, because it's really uh, connected directly with what you were just discussing. <laughs> um, John is, uh, is uh, 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 writing this, the, the following. Those, these presentations identify tensions between European music and more indigenous uh, traditions. And to what extent have these tensions been addressed by, uh, by discussion involving the students, uh, is his question. In other words, to what extent does talking directly with students about these tensions um, in addition to learning the music feature in the pedagogy? And if so, how successful are such discussions? And uh, John, John asked this question to all three speakers, so. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, I can say something. Uh, in, in my case, in, in Chiquiti, uh, where we, we play and we sing uh, classical music and traditional music, uh, we have a lot of variety of genders, and I agree what with uh, what Viviana was saying before. And um, the the students, of course, uh, sometimes the project choose what we are going to play, and, and uh, we play it and we sing it. Mm -hmm. But uh, when when we choose repertoire, I always like to involve the students uh, in this process. Uh, and sometimes they they tell me, "Oh, I really like this. Can we sing it? Can we can we do it?" And I, I use the, their suggestions in the repertoire. So I, uh, I, when it's possible, I like to, to, to use their choices and they are part of the discussion. And so I think that's important. Sometimes they just, oh, I really like this. Do you know this? And I don't know. And I'm going to listen. Okay, let's do it. Let's sing it. So I think it's it's really important to and also we had uh, we had a discussion also between the the students and me um, uh, about for example we we, we sang a, a Brazilian song um, and uh, we had a discussion about uh, the the pronunciation of the Portuguese if we should use the Brazilian pronunciation um, the accent or the Mozambican accent so sometimes we talk about uh, these topics and I think it's very important the, the students are part of the decision. Uh, in my view. I, I've seen uh, during my research, I've seen uh, discussions uh, between the teachers and the directors about uh, classical music or um, uh, our own, own music. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm posit positively sure about that, that we, we have to uh, walk out, avoid that discussion. I think music is, is, is music. So you have, to, you, you have to learn it. You have to uh, learn the, the cultural um, implications of every music, but you have to, you, we, um, we have to know. And I, 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 um, I think that this is positively that when you know something, you can choose. You can. You have a better a possibility to to make your own pathway. So um, I I don't know if they they talk with the students. I didn't see the, that um, that um, talk with the students about if classical, if uh, um, popular. But um, I. I saw that uh, in the meeting, teacher, uh, teachers' meetings, and I think it's about the 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 the, the teacher. The if if you studied in a conservatoire, it's different than if, if you study in a, a popular school of music, 
and that's uh, the, the the difficult <laughs> the dilemma that's where the dilemma begins um, in my case uh, sorry no uh, in, in Ginebra's case it's very interesting uh, because the traditional music practices uh, called Colombian Andean music um, it integrates the um, very um, past um, European um, music traditions that were inserted in, in the colony in Colombia. The, and it was um, transformed by um, Piazzant musical traditions also. So in the context of the schools, uh, when doing uh, this kind of music, the students doesn't really um, do this kind of um, separation between uh, within the musical practices, but in the context of the teachers and management uh, structures, this is a very high uh, sensitive discussion, yes. particularly because it touch um, musical identities of the teachers. Um, and in a project like mine, which is a very uh, small music school, uh, the, the, the uh, contradicting or um, criticizing uh, or just posing a discussion about uh, how conservative even these uh, traditional music practices can be um, in contrast to more progressive ways of um, presenting music pedagogies and including other musical diversities. Uh, it's, uh, it's very, very um, tension uh, discussion and sometimes even it by the, uh, has to coexist uh, in that way without discussing much uh, in some periods of the uh, of the project because uh, through the time because uh, it's difficult to manage the musical identities when each teacher is trying to contribute through its um, musical pedagogies and paradigms uh, to the um, to the project, so it in my case is becoming more and more an issue as the center to be discussed uh, on the renewal process of, of the pedagogical project of the school. Um, I have a question from Elise Gero, Gairo um, to Agata. Um, because Agata, you were just mentioning, uh, giving the example of the Sikitsi project, and uh, Elise uh, is asking, out of curiosity, did the students choose uh, the Portuguese or Mozambican accent, and and uh, what were their justifications then, and 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 their arguments for either side? Yeah, um, well, we all, we all speak Portuguese. I speak Portuguese from Portugal. I speak Portuguese from Mozambique. And the, the, the Brazilian song was with Portuguese uh, from Brazil. So uh, the discussion was between this, all these uh, Portuguese accents, different accents. Um, and uh, well, in the end, uh, we don't have a final answer for that because some students really prefer the Brazilian one uh, because they said that's the original one. And others said, no, but we are Mozambican, so we should sing with our accent. So in the end, um, it was kind of free. <laughs> they, they choose individually, more or less. So there's something that, uh, because it was, it was also uh, very interesting for me because uh, it was, uh, something for me to think also because here in Portugal if you we are going in the, in the choir if we are going to sing a, a Brazilian song for example uh, usually we sing with the accent with the Brazilian accent and that's not a, a topic for discussion usually the, but of course it should be so I think it was very interesting for me to listen both parts and and yeah in the in the end it was kind of free so I didn't want to choose one of the sides a very different question uh, from Grasa, Grasa Mota to uh, Viviana. Um, Grasa uh, wants to know, how did you test the relationship between the participation at the orchestra and the general school subject outcomes? Because you stated that there was uh, a positive correlation. So um, how did you test this? Okay, I did a qualitative approach, uh, an ethnographic approach. I was there in the field for uh, one year and a half. 
and had in-depth inter interviews and uh, co-constructed the narratives of the participants, of the young uh, participants that, um, that, that were part of my research. Uh, and uh, the, the, the co-construction of the narratives allowed me to construct the results in this regard. Uh, several students, for instance, reported uh, having uh, improved their grades and having improved their relationship between other students and, and the teachers as a result of their participation in the orchestra. Others uh, indirectly uh, referred having passed uh, the years um, uh, while before they were they had different dropouts or uh, they had to do the year again and in the period being in the orchestra uh, they not. They, they had a better, uh, better relationship with, with old school, I said uh, uh, minutes ago, that we have to construct uh, more, more global indicators of uh, successful school pathway, not only the grades, because it's a multidimensional well-being, as Maria said in the beginning, uh, well-being is a multidimensional um, uh, Construct. So we have the communitarian, the, the, the psychological, the social. Um, we have to 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 extend that uh, the, the the indicators we have. There are a lot of investigation research that uh, takes the, the grades as an indicator of of, um, of 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 good school pathways. I I think. I, I, do, I will not talk about correlations because it, it's not a quality, uh, quantitative uh, research. I think also we have to uh, conduct more research in that matter. We have to make um, a, lo, um, a, I, longitudinal. Social. Yes, longitudinal. But the, fund, the funds we have are very scarce, very little. Um, my PhD was a very a small um, amount of money, <laughs> and it's very difficult to to uh, to to carry out uh, uh, research like that. It's the, the next step, the next step for me. Mm. That's for sure. Well, the the last question I want to give give to you is exactly about this. It's uh, Georgia Lau. <laughs> Who is wondering where the funds are coming uh, from for the for the research that the three of you were, have been doing? So it's very difficult in us, the global tell south. The, <laughs> tell us about the money. Money issues are very difficult in the global south. <laughs> for, for that's that's my my impression. Uh, the, the orchestras uh, in Argentina, uh, we have three kinds of. Uh, or, or orchestras, uh, the publicly funded, uh, that are almost 300. Uh, and there are another from non-governmental uh, organizations. And uh, the last, that very little from private, uh, private, the private sector, uh, perhaps an, an industry that has, that uh, uh, funds, uh, gives money to an orchestra. Um, but the, the, the majority are publicly funded in, in the case of Argentina. And Natalia and Agata, you have uh, things to share with us about your budgets? Yeah, in my case, I had been very blessed by the fact that I won this uh, studentship between um, um, but, uh, under the agreement between uh, SIM platform and the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. And it thinks it's uh, an important effort to support um, Latin American research um, in, in collaboration with institutions um, such as Guildhall and, 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 and SIM platform. Um, regarding the Colombian context, uh, it's... Um, as Viviana mentioned, in Latin American countries, it's still difficult to uh, finance this type of research. Um, but it's increasing. The, the interest to finance uh, research is increasing, but it still is, is, is low uh, budgets. Uh, and 
and also there is not um, uh, evaluation, for example, culture of social impact here in Latin America, because precisely so, uh, some social projects uh, uh, within music are not necessarily funded by external or international uh, actors. So this has an impact on the way it is investigated. The, the, is, the is, is Brazil an exception then? In, uh, because I remember during the podcast, uh, one of the podcast uh, episodes uh, I discussed with uh, Samuel Araujo, and um, he, he uh, really uh, mentioned a number of possibilities uh, for financing of research in Brazil in, the, in, in our field. Is that exceptional then for the? Um, or? There are some initiatives in the Colombian government uh, through the. Um, um, the institutions for research, mm -hmm. but just by now, uh, musical research is being considered as in this kind of frameworks as um, knowledge production, uh, for example, in the creative practices and artistic practices. So it's very timid by now, and the budget is very slow, and also the training issues of uh, people involved in this, time, this type of projects doesn't help them to participate on gaining of these type of um, budgets for researching. So Agata, do you have something to share with us? This yeah, yeah I, I, I have, sorry. Concerning the money subjects. Yeah, well, uh, um, my I have a I have a scholarship, a PhD scholarship for my research to create a project. It's a public foundation from the state here in Portugal. It's foundation for science and technology, mm -hmm. and so that, that I have that scholarship during the the PhD period. Uh, and then the, the project that I'm that I'm uh, participating in and collaborating in, they, they have different uh, funds and they have private funds as sponsors and stakeholders. So, so Maria, um, do you are you okay that we start to to stop the session now? We're we getting start to stop. We are because we won't stop the research. That's for sure. We should only <laughs> stop the, quest, the session. <laughs> <laughs> no, on the contrary, I think I think it has uh, really enriched us to think about all these different lines uh, that have been brought up today, and we very much look forward to uh, having the the follow up to um, the this uh, compendium that is in preparation for Sim. Uh, we look forward to the further uh, publications from the comparative research. We look forward to Jeff Baker's book that is coming up I think in, in, in a couple of months and uh, and we look forward to keeping these exchanges going and so maybe uh, within the same platform we should think about how to to have to bridge the gap between one symposium and the other uh, now that we have found each other that we do not lose each other because mm -hmm. I, I think it especially at this moment um, it, it's so important to to keep the momentum and it's it's not easy to get it going, and and so and let let's not stop the strain. Okay, but stay still a bit with us, uh, all of you. Uh, but before closing the session, uh, we can now listen and see a, a short four minute uh, video of the community music project, the late project, the Lady Birds from the city of Ghent in in Belgium. And uh, musician uh, Matthias Laga is the founder of the Lady Birds. Uh, uh, hello, Matthias, you're there somewhere. And uh, I want to ask you to intervene and shortly tell us um, why your video uh, is called Broken Clocks mm -hmm. and who's playing the music in this video and who made the music. Matthias? Hello. Yes, I hear you. Yes, Matthias? No, you're, you're muted. So please put, put on your, your microphone. Is this better? Yes, this is yeah. better, yes. Uh, okay, <laughs> excuse me. So um, our projects are um, focusing on a community in the part of Ghent, Ledeberg. And so we unite musicians. And one of the projects we did uh, was looking in the archives 
uh, of composers in the past who were born in that part of Ghent or who were teachers there. So, but it was quite hard to to play that kind of music with uh, the diverse band. So then we started to use uh, minimalist concepts and we made lots of fun, we had lots of fun. And uh, one intern from the conservatory wrote a minimalist piece for us. It's named, uh, called Broken Clocks. And uh, I was very glad to now, because of the pandemic, we, we had to look into um, possibilities to play with the, with the kids that were allowed to come. And that was the, the ones under 12. Uh, luckily, the ones over 12 became uh, interns themselves. So we find a creative way to have them play along. And one of the youngsters made this video. So she got some lessons from another volunteer who made the first video. You saw the first session. Yes. And so she made a very nice montage. of. Mm -hmm. uh, and during uh, one of the activities, they also made a stop motion movie. So we had a nice title, Broken Clocks. And so the kids ma made a stop motion movie, which is also very shortly in the video. Mm. I hope you enjoy it. Yes, let's look at it. Thank you.
Thank you also, Maria Maino, Viviana Valenzuela, uh, Agata Rica, Natalia Puerta, Rafael Monoyer, and Amber de, de Munch for your precious contributions today, really. I also want to thank the scientific committee of this symposium, which included Grasa Motta, Anne de Bischop, uh, Marta Amico, and Annemone van Zeil. As most of you know, all the sessions of, the sim, of this symposium were recorded, so you can find them on the websites of Bozar and Sim if you want to look at them again or show them to other people. Uh, our next symposium will be organized on the 3rd and 4th of November this year at the Philharmonie de Paris in a close collaboration with the Fondation Royaumont. And next week, you will already be able to find the call for presentations uh, for this uh, upcoming symposium in November. On the, you can find it on the SIM website next week. Our SIM podcast will continue to be broadcast, but less frequently than the last two months. Uh, from now on, we will, we will propose monthly episodes of the SIM podcast and we already have almost 600 listeners. So uh, um, even though we, we only started two months ago, so um, curious to see how that develops. I hope you will be with us uh, again for future initiatives of the SIM platform. Goodbye. Goodbye, everybody.